I want to thank you for being here for this message upon the first day of the week. I hope that I am able to get it posted Sunday. Uh, I've been having a little bit of trouble with the internet. But the lesson I want us to think of is the precious gift or that precious gift. When I say that precious gift, I mean that, that gift of Jesus, that gift of the Christ. That gift that we often look to not as, or that gift that I would look to now, not as the gift of the Christ coming as a baby, but the gift of that Christ, that Jesus who was willing to die on a cross. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, we find that Jesus' purpose, his whole purpose, was this idea that he come to the cross. And so in Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 21, he says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. I want us to think about that idea of a Christ who coming into this world, knowing who he was knowing that he was here to give his life and trying to explain that, trying to get people to understand that, that his life and his death was going to lead to a, such a great, such a great promise, such a great thing as this forgiveness of sin and an eternal life. And so often we forget. So often we, we, as we go through life, we don't think about these things. I listen to a song of an artist that I like very much. It's called In the Shadow of the Cross, and it's not necessarily the one that is in most of our uh, songbooks. But it says, in the shadow of the cross, I have finally found some peace. In the shadow of the cross, I, or as I journey up the rocky road of life, it offers shelter and relief. Through the mountain and the valleys, it marks the way so I'm not lost. As I travel up the steep and narrow trail in the shadow of the cross. In the shadow of the cross, oh, the healing power there. Freedom from the pain that life may bring. There's only comfort and care. For a bright and mighty promise, it was there he paid the cost. With the best that the master had to give. In the shadow of the cross. In the shadow of the cross, that's where I lay my burdens down. And when the flood of doubt comes rolling in, it's my place of higher ground. God help me to remember that precious blood that stained the tree. God grant that I may never forget that precious blood that was shed for me. I want us to think about that because as we look at it, this idea of, of this cross, it, it is to remind us, I guess you would say, of this idea of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, or at least that's where it has found its place in society today. And so often we don't think about this cross as we should, or we don't think about the event as we should. Many dwell on this idea maybe once or twice a year. And yet it is the very basic or very basis for which everything we believe stands upon. This morning I want to look at this idea in the shadow of the cross. It was all done for me. I want us to think just a little bit. I want us to connect this Lord's Supper that we partake of. I want us to connect that and this thought of the death, the burial, and the resurrection and put it together. Well, it's very simple. It's a very simple lesson. And yet if we will pay attention, if we'll think about what's being said, if we'll think about what's taking place, it is one of those things that is a very convicting idea. It's one that should, that should make me look at myself and feel the pain of guilt, but also the joy 
of forgiveness. In Hebrews, the third chapter, or yeah, Hebrews third chapter, verse one, we read the scripture last week in the lesson. He says, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. And I would like for us to do just that this morning. Consider Jesus. Sometimes we don't dwell enough on that. We look for things that make us feel good, and that's great. And there are many things that should give us a great feeling, a, a feeling of, of security. But even in all the pain that we may see here in this thought this morning, there is still that great gift of security for those who believe. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26, it says, For I received from the Lord that or what I also delivered to you. This is Paul speaking. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We ever thought about what it means to proclaim the Lord's death? To bring into memory that death, the burial and resurrection. To look and, and think, this is the Jesus. This is the man who sought for me. This is the man who loved me. It is so hard sometimes for me to get a hold of the idea that someone would die for me. Especially before I even became a, a, a thought. And especially because he knew who I was and he knew that even after he had offered himself on that cross, I was going to sin. We're going to read 1 Corinthians 11. And starting in the middle of 23, he says that the Lord Jesus, on that night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want us to remember today. I want us to think on these thoughts today. I want us to go to Mark, the 15th chapter, in verse 6. And I want us to consider the body. It's just simply listen to the words that are written. And take in thinking about this idea that he offered his body. Mark 15 verse 6. We're going to read through verse 20. Now at the feast, this is at the feast before Passover. Now at the feast, Pilate used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred the crowd and to have him to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with this man you call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, Released to them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. The stall, as we look at it, he replaced, or he was, he was given 
Barabbas was given great honor over Christ, a thief given the freedom, and one who was innocent facing the death of crucifixion. A shameful death, a death that was saved only for the vilest of, of people. It says Pilate had him scourged. In other words, they took a cat of nine tails or whatever it might have been, and they gave him 40 lashes minus one, since 40 lashes would have been a death sentence. But I want us to continue listening to what was done. It says, Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace. And they called together the whole battalion. That was 600 soldiers. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns. And they put it on him and they began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and, and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him and stripped him of the purple cloak, and they put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. You see, this idea that he was so shamefully treated his body had been ravaged. He had been uh, uh, treated shamefully. He'd been treated as, as the worst of, of men and proclaimed or had been given the sentence of death of the vilest of offenses. And now Pilate turns his body over to the Jews. See, this is the idea that he gave his body. He said, remember my body, the abuse, the pain, the, the situation that he had to go through. And so they take his tortured body and they lay him down on that cross and they nail him to it and they lift him up. And lift him up and so to say, we have won. Yet that lifting up meant that he had won. It's hard for us to look at this idea and see it. And yet it, he put him on that cross so that all men might know. So that all men might know who this Christ was. And that he had willingly offered his body. Knowing who he was, knowing what he was going through, he had willingly offered his body and did not resist. Isaiah talks about it being as sheep led to slaughter. Not making a sound, no resistance. Giving himself so that man might have the salvation that was so necessary for him to have if he was going to be reconciled with God. But I want us to continue. Matthew, the 27th chapter, verse 32. We're going to read through verse 50. It says, as they went out, as they went out going to the crucifixion, as they went to climb that hill to Golgotha, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled him to carry his cross, and when they came to the place of Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. We need to understand that what they were trying to, what they were trying to give him was a, a, a concoction that would have numbed pain, but he refused it. He, he was going through that suffering. That was his. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And then they sat down to keep watch and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the king of the, two, of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. 
And those who passed by derided him, wagging their head and saying, Who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers were crucified with him, also reviled him in the same way. He says, Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. In the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed to give and gave to him to drink. But the other said, Wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up the spirit. To hang on the cross. The most severe punishment anyone has really ever come up with. The most painful way to die that we can imagine over a, a great length of time. In John, the 19th chapter, that last phrase that was read. In John 19, 30, it says, Jesus said, it is finished. The Greek word that's used there means it was paid in full. The dad owed by man to his creator. Because of the sin was forever, or because of that death, because of that way that he died. That sin was forever dealt with. If we seek Christ. His body was given in completeness through that death. And it is difficult for us to dwell on. Because we're guilty. We are at fault. That's hard for us to accept sometimes. That we're at fault. We're the ones. We're the cause. It's our sin. That made. or, or in, it's, that, it's our sin that caused him to have to be crucified. The sin of man. He gave his body. That's what we're to remember. We're to remember the way this body was given. We're to remember that he was hung on a cross as someone who was shameful, someone who was the vilest of men. I would suppose that would be to remind us that he died for vileness, for that which was sin, that which we committed. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, he says, in the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, "This is my, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me." And there's already been blood spilled. He had been whipped and beat. But he had bled. Enough blood to make him weak, he'd face that beating. But there's still more to it. If we go over to John, the 19th chapter. John 19, verse 31. It says, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross. It was a uh, very custom for a body to hang 12, 16, 18 hours on that cross, maybe longer. In this case, Jesus did not hang that long on that cross. 
as far as life. It didn't take him that long to die. And yet there were others there who were hanging on those crosses. And since it was the preparation for uh, I want to say the Passover but it, the, it was that time that was a holy day. It says so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath for the Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken so that they might be taken away. In other words, it would break their legs and they would hang until they suffocated. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that it was already that he was already dead, they did not break his leg, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who was he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will not look on him, or they will look on him whom they have pierced. I want us to think about that for just a moment. They come to the Christ, and he is he's already dead. This somewhat comes to a point of proof that as they pierced his side, the blood and the water gushed forth. It had already separated and, and it had already come to a point of gathering in that body cavity. And when they pierced him, it flowed out. We come to this point of that blood that was shed for you and me. That blood which covers the sin. The blood that covers the sin. And this is this idea of the body and the blood. It covers the sin of those who are his children. It will cover the sin of all men who come to him. But after all these things, he was placed on the tomb. And, and we see this great time of grieving. It should bring us to a very somber place, yes. We should look and see this, this, this gruesome punishment, this death, this burial where he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But it's a great time of grieving. And yet... After all these things, he was placed in that tomb. And on the first day of the week, the women had come to prepare his body for that burial. We have this time where there was much sadness, much hurt, much pain. Luke 24, verse 1. It said, but on the first day of the week, the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, but ta taking the spices they had prepared, and they found a stone rolled away from the tomb. But when, when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all those, these things to the eleven and to the rest. There were those that, that had went, those women who had went, they, they realized that there was more. We look at many and we look at Thomas and so he doubted, they all doubted. They all had great difficulty in believing that their Savior had risen from the grave. But even in his death, there was this great and glorious event of the resurrection. You see, that's part of that remembrance. 
Christ died for us. He was buried and remained in that tomb for three days and was resurrected. So that if we follow him, we might have life in the resurrection. You see, without such a death of Christ, or without such, that death of Christ would have not meant anything. It would have been useless. You see, any man could die, any man could die on a cross. Many vile men died on the cross, but not any had ever been resurrected. Not any had risen from the grave as, as he had told himself. He had it had been prophesied through thousands of years that he would come, that he would die, that he would rise on the third day. And it was just as it happened. So often it, it's so hard for us to get a hold of that, but this idea that through Christ, his, or in Christ, that resurrection, he became victorious. Over death. He became victorious over that, that eternal death. We go back over to Hebrews, the second chapter. We read this passage also last week. But see, he became victorious over death. That's what this, that's what this death, burial, and resurrection is about. He was a sacrifice that was made perfect through that death and was resurrected. Hebrews 2 verse 14. He says, since therefore children share, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, this is Jesus, likewise partook of the same things and that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. This idea of being victorious over the devil, the deliverer and deliver all things who through fear of death were subject to life, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery, those who were lost into sin who were willing to follow him. For surely it is not the angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham, those who seek him in faith. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers. That's each one of us as a child of God. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people to this idea that that blood covers the sins of those who seek him continually. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. We're being tempted. This one who is our Lord and our Savior. This one whom we call Christ. He overcame death through the resurrection. He defeated Satan. He overcame sin. He offers us the same opportunity. If we seek his blood. If we come to him seeking his blood, following him in obedience. He said, you can be my children. Without that death, burial, and resurrection, it would not be. It would not be. Yes, we are guilty. Yes, it is our sin that placed Jesus on that cross. It's difficult for us to get a hold of that he loved us so much. That he was willing to die on that cross that each of us might be reconciled 
be brought back to God as children of his. That we might have all the things that God is willing to offer. This eternal life. This time with him. I want us to go to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. In verse 4, so starting in verse 4 through 6. This is said, a prophet, this is prophecy about the Christ. He says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, it's only through Christ. Not any one of us deserve anything, and yet Christ was willing to sacrifice his body. He was willing to give his blood that we might have the forgiveness of sin. That we might be able to enjoy an eternity with God. But we have to accept this Jesus as the Son of God. We have to look to Him. We have to be obedient and follow Him. We think about this idea, he says, no greater thing has man done than, than, or, that could one do than to give his life. No greater thing. And each of us have a Savior who has given his life that we might be reconciled to God. But we have to choose. Are we willing? We partake of the Lord's Supper. Are we, are we take, partaking of that Lord's Supper and thinking about the precious gift that God has given to us? Thinking about the pain and the anguish and, and the heartache that Jesus went through because he loved me, because he sought to have me as a brother, because he wanted me to have Eternity with him. There is not a more precious gift. There just isn't. We need to take and look at this idea, not just on this Sunday we call Easter, but each day of our life we need to look up and realize that Christ was crucified on a cross. For me. And as guilty as I am of putting him there, he did it all for me, each one of us. He loved us so much that he willingly gave himself to die. Are we willing to live for him? Are we willing to give ourselves over and really strive? To live for him. It's a question we need to ask ourselves each day. I want to leave us with this thought this morning. We have a Christ. Who loves us so much. That he faced death on a cross. Because of our sin. And yet he loved us so much, he was willing to die there that we might have eternity with God. I hope you find the encouragement in that. I hope you can see that great gift that God gave and what it should mean to us. I want to thank you for being with us here today and may God bless. <music>